the topic tonight is one that uh, normally we have just a verse by verse Bible study. But every once in a while there's a topic that um, you can't sort of elude. It's really uh, 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 very, uh, probably very controversial. Um, have you ever wondered about this whole issue of uh, Sabbath and Sunday? You read all through the Bible, the Sabbath this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, so, and uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, we don't do that, do we? We, we worship on Sunday. And we, I've heard all the usual excuses, you know, for, for 40, 50 years, you know, been exposed to a lot of the arguments both ways. And um, uh, it's interesting that very, there are some you know, good people on both sides of that debate. Um, how many of you here have been troubled by that one way or the other? Okay, so it's not, okay, good. That's why I finally said, nuts, we're going to just jump into this and see what we can do. Now, uh, I should warn you in advance, um, we'll try to have something to offend everyone. We won't play any favorites. Um, some of the lawyers tell me that the, the definition of a satisfactory settlement is when both sides feel they've been equally cheated. See, And so we're going to talk, we're going to talk a little bit about the Sabbath day. Some of the questions we'll try to, to deal with is, did God institute the Sabbath just for Israel? That's the common understanding by most Christians. Well, the Sabbath's an Old Testament thing. That's Moses' law. Well, okay. The other question is, is, the, is what lurks behind all this is a Christian supposed to keep the Ten Commandments? Or just nine of them? I'm always reminded of that little cartoon that was the New Yorker. It was a church. It had a sign out in front. The, you know, the Light Church, L-I-T-E Church. Uh, we're the home of the seven and a half percent tithe. Uh, we have only seven commandments. Your choice. A Fifteen-minute sermon. Uh, you know, had the, just a facetious. Uh, you know, everything you wanted in a church and less. You know, and so. Uh, but anyway, um, one of the issues: Does a Christian have to keep the Sabbath? That's one of the questions that lurks in the back of our mind. Give you a lot of good, glib theological answers. Why not? And yet, it, link, it lurks there. And uh, if so, when did Sunday replace Saturday as the holy day? When did that happen? Where's the, you know, where's the authority for that? Where's the text for that? And we may have some surprises by looking at the Sabbath day prophetically, which is the thing that caused me the most disturbance as I got into it. Well, let's back up before we jump into this topic and talk a little bit about our roots. You might turn with me to um, Genesis chapter 3. Virtually every... Uh, almost every major doctrine in the Bible has its roots planted in Genesis chapter 3. This first observation that we'll share or look into a little bit isn't directly related to the Sabbath day, but there's a reason I want to get into it. If you look at the first um, six verses, they're well familiar to you. That's where the serpent, the Nachash, the nachash uh, was more subtle or uh, clever or whatever than any beast of the field so forth. And uh, said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. Verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, Ye, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now he hadn't said, lest ye touch it, but she sort of added that, which is the first indication of some kind of a problem. Verse 4, The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now there's Satan's steps. He hasn't changed in all these years. His first step is to cast doubt about God's word. Yea, hath God said? And the second step is to deny it. Or refuted in some way. You know, you shall not surely die, contradicting God. For God doth surely know that the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree that desired to, be one, to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and also gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. We're all very, very famous episode, deserving of a great deal of study. But then both of their eyes, verse 7, were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now we normally take this idea of nakedness as you and I would jump to the conclusion of nakedness, but it may mean far more than that. We infer from other passages that, bear, bear in mind, they, up until then they were sinless. They walked with God. There are some scholars that believe they were clothed with light. The challenge I usually give to a knowledgeable group is they prove to me that Adam and Eve only lived in three dimensions. They probably did, but you can't prove it. We only know everything about the creation and ourselves post-curse. But the key point here is they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. That's a very, very key point. That's the beginning of religion. That's the beginning of religion in the Bible. They tried to cover themselves. All religion tries to cover itself. 
The rebuttal to this is, uh, when, the real reason I got into all this is I want to call your attention to a verse that most people don't pick up on, and that's verse 21 of this chapter. Let's take verse 20 and 21. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now the rabbis will point out that that verse, especially in the Hebrew, has far more significance than simply that it was her offspring populated the earth. That's certainly the way most of us read it. Mother of all living, sure, because her sons and their sons, you know, that started the population of the planet earth for the last uh, 6,000 years, whatever, right? The rabbis point out that she's the mother of all living in another sense, also, because out of her came the Messiah. And so when you see, that, when you see any phrase like that, uh, put Christ right in the middle of it, and it'll give it a whole other complexion, if you will. But then verse 31 says, for Adam, uh, And for Adam also, and for his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? This is one of these little one-liners that's dropped in there, that if you're just reading the narrative, doesn't seem to have much import. But if you read from here through Revelation 22 and come back, by the time you've embraced the rest of the Bible, that verse has profound significance. What's, it, what's God really doing here? Giving them leather coats because they're more durable than the fig leaves they had sewn together? No. I don't think God would busy himself in that regard. What's hinted here at... It's taken for granted, in a sense, uh, that the reader, if he's read, the, understands the Bible. God is teaching them that by the shedding of innocent blood they would be covered, not by their own effort. So it's a Levitical statement. And that becomes very significant when you get to chapter 4 in the Cain and Abel story. We all know about Cain and Abel. Cain, took, who was a farmer, took the fruit of the ground. Abel was a shepherd, took one of the sheep. One person's offering was accepted, the other one was not. There's speculation as to why Cain's offering was not accepted. Sin lieth at the door. Some say it was just envy. It, indeed, it may have been because Abel's offering was accepted. What everybody misses is the high likelihood. This is conjectural, but it's based on, I think, some good perceptions of the total, total body of God's Word, is that the idea of a sacrificial offering was instituted in Eden, and it was a lamb. The fact that Abel was a shepherd is not the point. He was giving an offering of faith, an offering that pointed to the ultimate lamb that was prophetically foreshadowed by Genesis 22 when Abram offered his son Isaac, etc. All through the scripture, the pointers, the focus, the, the anticipation is of a cross on Calvary. As I love to characterize it, a love letter written in blood on a wooden cross some 2,000 years ago. Now... Once you understand that, when you get that glimmer, suddenly verse 21 of Genesis 3 has a different implication. The whole story of Cain and Abel has another coloration. You begin to understand that. Having said all that now, the, the, the clear indication, and I don't want to spend all our evening building the background, but many of the ideas that get formalized in the Mosaic Law were planted originally in Eden. That's my premise. Don't accept it. Check it out with your own study. But I want you to at least be exposed to that possibility because I think it's very fundamental. A lot of things the Bible started, to, a lot of the, the myths started to clarify once you begin to realize that Genesis is a summary, not a detailed chronology. I want to ask you, how many of each animal did Moses put in the ark? Anyone have a ten? How many said two? How many said two? It wasn't Moses. It was Noah. Come on. <laughs> I played a dirty trick. It's a little, <laughs> little early in the evening. But you picked up the spirit of the thing, right? Most of, several of you got the right point. We all, because it's so classically summarized in children's books, two by two, but if you, I want you to take a good look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, in case you're not following us. In Genesis chapter 7, in verse 2, God says, Of every clean beast... Thou shalt take to thee by sevens, male and female, and of the beasts that are not clean, by two, male and his female. So as you visualize this procession going to the ark, you see two of each of the unclean, and seven each of the clean. Here's the question you can spring on your biblically oriented friends. How did Noah know what was clean and unclean? There's nothing intrinsically unclean about an unclean animal. The terms are Levitical. They are ceremonial. They're ritualistic. 
Pork is not clean. Pork is unclean. Why? Because the pigs roll in mud? No, it's got nothing to do with it. Clean and unclean, we, you and I, because we've read the Bible, we've been exposed to more of the Old Testament, take for granted that, yeah, there's these two categories, clean and unclean. Clean animals were used for sacrifice. Unclean were not. They didn't, they didn't, not only did they not eat them, they didn't do other, other things. They, they, were, they were two categories, but they're Levitical categories. Levitical categories. Now, what's the point I'm making? Noah, God could say that to Noah and he'd understand what he's talking about. What does that tell you? That there were institutions established long before Genesis 7. These ideas were prevalent. We know from Genesis 4, Cain and Abel gave offerings. Where are the rules? Where are the, where's the requirement? Where's the procedure? Not recorded because we don't have that level of detail back then. The idea of clean and unclean animals apparently were established back in Eden. They were later codified under Mosaic law. Do you follow what I'm saying? And by the way, Noah was declared righteous. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Was he circumcised? No. Not to our knowledge. That was established in uh, Genesis 17. Key point. Abraham, who is generally regarded as the first Jew, the way I like to uh, upset my Jewish friends, God called an idol worshiping uh, called Abraham out of an idol worshiping culture in Ur of the Chaldees and made him the first Jew. And they didn't like it put that way, but um, he was declared righteous in Genesis 15, verse 6. He wasn't circumcised till Genesis 17. What circumcision got to do with the righteousness? Zero. Not really zero, because he was observant, he followed God's instruction, pretty much, not perfectly. And yet he was righteous. So there's those, there are those issues that start to emerge. Now, it's interesting, the premise that I'm assuming, and I, can, I think I can do it with some basis, I'm going to try to show that, is I suspect that the idea of the Sabbath was established in Eden. That's where I'm headed. Before we get even get into that, I want you a little more perspective on those early chapters before we jump to it. And by the way, this idea of clean and unclean, in Ezekiel 44, I just happened to see this and I thought it was interesting. In Ezekiel 44, verses 23 and 24, there are some verses to the priests, some instructions to the priests. But what caught my eye is the linkage in the mind of the presenter and thus planted in the priest is the linkage between this clean and unclean idea and the Sabbath. In Ezekiel 44, verse 23, it says, And they shall teach thy people the difference between the holy and the profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in controversy they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments, and they shall keep my laws and statutes and all my assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. There's more to the passage, but the point is these things are a package that the priests... Now, it's Levitical. It's speaking of Ezekiel. It's actually talking about the millennium looking back, but okay. Well, let's get at the Sabbath. That's really our subject for tonight. Having said all that, turn to Genesis chapter 2. And we'll just read, uh, oh, the first three verses. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Two different words, created and made. How many people were around at that time? How many? Two, huh? We, 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 you know, we, have, we have sons and daughters and things coming, I think, right? A couple. Maybe, anyway, it's Adam and Eve, and if, if they had any children by then. I don't think they did, by the way. I think they had their children after the fall. Question, were they Jewish? Well, not, 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 they were only in the sense that if you take the woman of Revelation 12, it starts with Eve. As the, as the path from which the Messiah comes, who of course is Jewish. But I mentioned, I'm, I'm sort of being uh, uh, tongue in cheek here a little bit. There's something else that I would like to uh, get at. Um, yeah, maybe we should, let's, uh, maybe this is where we should have started. Let's start with Genesis 1, verse 1. 
Let's just take a quick, a quick glimpse at Genesis chapter 1, because I want to get us another point. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. Seven words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved, brooded, upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, and that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. That's interesting. See, you and I think of darkness as the absence of light. That ain't this kind of darkness, because God separated light from darkness, two different things. We know that today, that's where we can talk about things like black holes and stuff, but let's move on. Verse 5, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day, or more precisely... The evening and the morning were day one. It's expressed in a very peculiar, unique way. The others are not that way. The evening and the morning, that's what I want to focus on a little bit. The word in the Hebrew today for evening is Erev. The word for morning is Bokar. Bokar Tov, good morning. Erev Tov, good night. Lila Tov, good evening. But anyway, because of that, it's translated appropriately, the evening and the morning were the first day. But if you start digging into the early roots of this passage, there are scholars that believe the root meaning of Erev was chaos or darkness. And it became the common term for evening because that's when the sun sets, things start to become indistinct and dark. In contrast to Boker, which... The, in the morning, as twilight comes, you can begin to see structure and things and colors. If you visualize the, the sunrise, it's dark, you can't see what's going on, but as the light comes, you can begin to discern forms and shapes and so forth. And so they, they see the word boker, they ha- its original concept was order. We have the evening and the morning being the first day. One of the things that we know today, using the terminology of the entropy laws, the second law of thermodynamics is, is uh, uh, that you, you always have a loss, right? I don't want to get into a whole thermodynamics session here, but there is, a, there is an entropy laws which in the thermodynamic sense are called the second law of thermodynamics, which essentially says anytime you have a, a, a transfer of energy, there's a loss. There's no such thing as 100% efficiency. There's always a loss to the ambient. The ambient is called entropy thermodynamically. In an information sense, it's randomness. Order or design is the opposite of randomness or chaos or disorder. Now, one of the things that we experience today is that the entire universe is heading towards disorder. Putting it in thermodynamics term, the entire universe is moving towards a uniform temperature. You can only do work if there's a temperature difference. And as you do work and there's a temperature difference, but you're always losing some, you're contributing to the overall ambience or entropy and uh, the theory is that someday, since ne- they never see reversals of this, it's always downhill. It's as if the whole universe has been wound up and is winding down. Billions and billions of years, whenever, it'll suffer what the, the cosmologists would call a heat death, when there's uniform temperature, no more work can be done. You observe the entropy laws in every field of science except one. Every, there's, every field of science, in its own area of interest, observes, recognizes, acknowledges the so-called entropy laws. Except one field. That's biology. The whole concept of life. You can't create order. Order is added externally. But they ignore that. But I won't start on that one. The creation would start, using entropy terms, with maximum entropy. And when you start creating order, you're reducing entropy. entropy. Think of entropy as randomness. As you start designing, you start doing something, you are adding information. And as God creates, one view of Genesis 1 is there were six specific stages of entropy reduction or design or creation. And the evening and the morning, the root meaning may be the reduction of entropy. Okay? Because the evening and morning were the first day. Creation was going on. And you, as you will, let's read on. Uh, verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. 
and the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and gathering together the waters he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. Every day he saw that it was good, except Monday. Interesting. And God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation and herb bearing seal. Let the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, herb yielding uh, seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, and divide the night for, uh, the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days or for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the nights, and made the stars also. And God let, set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the, the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and morning were the fourth day. Each day has its achievements, each day is a specific parsing of time. Each day um, is reckoned by evening and morning. It's because of this language that the Jewish calendar reckons a day beginning at sundown. You and I think of it midnight to midnight in, a, in, a normal, uh, in our normal reckoning. I suppose most of us, if we had a choice, probably we would think of it from morning to the next morning or something. But we go from midnight to midnight for a lot of reasons. The Jews... Reckon it from sundown to sundown because of this Erev and Boker issue. Verse 20, God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly, moving, uh, the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. God created great sea monsters, every living uh, thing that moveth, and the waters brought forth abundantly <clears throat> after their kind, and every winged fowl after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters in the seas. Let fowls multiply on the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures after its kind, cattle and creeping thing, beast of the earth after its kind. It was so. And God made the beast of the earth after its kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God creates man. God said, Let us make man in our own image. I like the plural there. Let us make man. you got a trinity hinted here already. And the, the trinity is even in the grammar, but I won't get into that here. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. And God created man in his own image. And the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and do it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and after the fowl of the air and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of the, yield, uh, the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. And, every, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so, and God saw that every thing that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Let's look at the seventh day. Verse, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. And the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended the work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And then goes on some summaries and some more detail about when he created man. But question, where is the evening and the morning of the seventh day? It ain't there. Which tends to confirm, in my mind at least, this uh, perspective that the Arab and Boker are linked to the days of creation. Now, this is not why we have a, you know, a, a six days of creation problem. That will come up in Exodus. I'll come back to that. But um, this whole issue, with there are diagrams and, and a much more a detailed discussion of this in our briefing pack called Stretching the Heavens, where we try to profile these reductions of, of uh, entropy during the first six days. During the seventh day and following... The, the entropy level is described as being level. Why? Because we believe, for a number of reasons, doesn't mean we're correct, that the entropy laws had their institution in Genesis 3. And the reason we say that is that in Romans chapter 8, where it talks about the redemption, 
not just of you and I, but of the creation. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about how the creation is groaning to be relieved from the bondage of decay. This bondage of decay seems to be the entropy laws, which appear to be a byproduct of the curse on the earth. There is a huge discontinuity that takes place. There are several of them. One is at Genesis chapter 3, when God pronounces the curse as a result of Adam and Eve's sin. And there are many of us that have a background in physics that are also serious Bible students that uh, believe that that's when, that as part of the curse that God pronounced upon the creation, the entropy laws, the decay started towards the bondage of decay. And uh, it has another discontinuity at the flood of Noah. The flood of Noah was far more than just a lot of water and what have you. The whole ecology of the earth changed. Uh, we even know that from the fossil records. Pterodactyls could not fly in an atmosphere of only one atmosphere and such. So there were some major, major ecological changes, not just the water. That uh, the, the earth prior to Genesis, we have no insight at all, zero, of the creation prior to Genesis 3. We jump to all kinds of conclusions because we assume that it's the same in Genesis 4 as it was in Genesis 2. Well, I don't think so, for a lot of reasons. Also, the world changed substantially at the flood of Noah, and there's a whole other study there. And, uh, but the, the, the promise that's held out, this all takes perspective when you see the promises in the New Testament that we're gonna, the, the curse is going to be relieved. What does that really mean? More than just the lion and the lamb lying down together. They do that today. The lamb's usually inside of the lion, but they do like that. Okay. okay. Now, we're going to go further on the Sabbath thing. That's really what we're trying to track. But I want to remind you here, a very, very key, in Mark 2, verse 27, there's a very, very important de declaration by none other than our Lord Himself. And we're going to hear more about this tonight. But He said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Somehow this whole thing got end for end. It becomes a huge burden to some. But Jesus' declaration is, Sabbath was made for man. God instituted the Sabbath. He used the pattern of his own rest after six days as his pattern. Uh, he personally stood as, as the example to give man a break, a blessing. To get them to understand that, he enforced it in very rigorous terms in the early period. But the intent, clearly, all along, beginning, middle, and end, is as a blessing to take advantage of. Now I'm going to suggest that Jesus' words, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, points to a period prior to the Ten Commandments in the original purpose and will of God. And uh, the Sabbath came into being when man came into being. And it was set apart and blessed as a divine example. Now where is the Sabbath first mentioned? Ah, see, it wasn't really mentioned Sabbath here. It just said the seventh day is blessed. Let's turn to Exodus 16. Exodus 16. There's a familiar story, but if there's aspects of it, I'll bet you that you may never, may never have occurred to you. And in Exodus 16, we have the advent of the manna. How many have heard of manna? Huh? Manna Shevitz, manna Kadi, you know manna. Okay, right. Okay. Um, first mention of the Sabbath, or the Hebrew verb Shabbat, is uh, meaning to rest from labor, is the verb form of it. Noun is a day of rest. Um, is in Exodus 16, verse 23. In verse 23, I won't go through the whole story of the manna, but God says unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, seethe what ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until morning. Exodus 16:23. But then he goes on in the details there that for six days they had to gather the manna. Every night this strange thing, this white stuff. In fact, that's what they said. What, what is it? That's what manna means. What is, what, what, what's it? You know? uh, God called it the bread of, uh, you know, bread of life and other uh, terms. But the, the people thought, what's this stuff? You know? That's what the word, <laughs> the word comes from. But anyway, for six, every, for six days they would gather. It would become their, their, their staple, the food. It would never, they would never carry over for another day. Every day that was fresh. Except on Friday. On Friday, twice as much fell. Every person had to gather their own. You couldn't gather for somebody else. That was the instruction if you go through all this, which is kind of interesting. See, this bread of life is the same way, this Bible we have. Everybody has to get their own.
so to speak, learn it themselves. But anyway, the point is, on that Friday, they carried, there was twice as much, they got twice as much, and that time it didn't spoil overnight. That would last them through Shabbat. The pattern of six and then one is established here in Exodus 16. But the word Sabbath day is mentioned because it's taken for granted. They, he doesn't explain the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is the context in which this is instituted. You follow me? Now what makes this relevant is this is Exodus 16. What chapter, when are the Ten Commandments given? Chapter 20. This is four chapters before the Ten Commandments. The point is the Sabbath and its observation has got nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments have one of them is to honor that remember the Sabbath day, but it doesn't institute it. The institution, I believe, was back in Eden. In any case, it is operative here. This is at least a month, probably about a month before Mount Sinai. Not a big deal, except it disconnects it conceptually from Mount Sinai. They, they, the, the law is yet something forthcoming, you see. The chapter 16 gets into all the details. But the main point I want to leave, this is the first mention of the Sabbath, and it's before the law. By the way, the ancient Babylonian calendar also, we, we know from, have recovered inscriptions, and the bricks among the royal palace, the Babylonians obser observed a week of seven days. And the Sabbath on these inscriptions is, is designated the Sabbatu. And it was defined as a day of rest for the heart, a day of completion of labor. Apparently it also was an echo or a vestige, if you will, of an earlier institution. Well, let's get at it. The, the real thing is going to be Exodus 20. That's the Ten Commandments. How many have heard of the Ten Commandments? 20%. We're not with you. Are you? Not kidding. Okay. Got a problem here. All right. And, of course, the fourth um, commandment is the one we're focusing on here. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do thou thy work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, uh, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the, thy stranger which is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. That's the fourth commandment. Next one goes on to honor thy father and the mother and so on. Now, it's this expression here in Exodus 20 that labels the Sabbath as a uniquely Hebrew institution. Why? Because they kept it. Was this around in other cultures? There are apparently hints of it, but obviously no, no uh, follow-through or, or injunction to keep it in this, uh, to the extent the Hebrews have. And it also becomes a very integral part of the covenant that God makes with them at Sinai. And that's amplified in Deuteronomy 4 and 5, and we won't take the time to go into all of that. I want to keep this moving here. These words are often expressed in connection with Israel being delivered from Egypt. Is, they went down as a family. Jacob and his sons, when they all get finally together, unified uh, under Joseph in that story, you had 70 souls down. They went down as a family of 70, but they come out four centuries later as a nation. The birth of the many passages in the scripture treats the exodus of Egypt as the birth of the nation, as an entity. And that's very much linked to the circumcision and the, the uh, uh, Sabbath are among those that are distinctives of the people. Now one of the questions here that should be lurking in our minds, yes it's ordained to Israel in a very special sense, but its intention, its ordination, was commemorative what? The creation. So we as objects of his creation would assume that we might uh, indeed avail ourselves of the um, blessings. It was instituted for a blessing, not as a burden, as a blessing. It's put in rigorous terms to teach them the importance of it. But um, God takes himself seriously, as we'll find out. Um, so the Sabbath was instituted as a memorial, if you will, of the Creator. Now question, let's not get ourselves confused. Who was the Creator? Most of us tend to read our Old Testament. Well, you know, think of, it, think of him as Elohim or God the Father. But John straightens us out on that point. Let's remind ourselves of the first three verses of the Gospel of John. They're very relevant to this discussion. John chapter 1, first three verses. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word. It's a title. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness overcame it not. Well, let's keep going. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's not John the writer, it's John the Baptist. But anyway, the same was for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. I always remember that little two-line poem. He was crucified on a cross of wood. Yet he made the hill on which it stood. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the great tragedy, verse 11. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. And verse 14. This is a key one. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And it goes on. So who's the creator? Jesus Christ. And Colossians 1, 16 and 17 emphasize it virtually the same way. Let's move on, so I don't go too long here. The whole idea of the Sabbath uh, commemorates the Creator. It was recognized also, it's made for man. It recognized the basic need for man. The physical necessities of each of us require a day of rest. Our whole bodily welfare requires one day and seven for rest. F.W. Robertson summarizes very well both moral and spiritual necessities of man demand a Sabbath. He says, quote, I am more and more assured by experience that the reason for the observance of the Sabbath lies deep in the everlasting necessities of the human nature. That as long as man is man, the blessedness of keeping it, not as a day of rest only, but as a day of spiritual rest, will never be annulled. I certainly do feel by experience the eternal obligation because of eternal necessity of the Sabbath. The soul withers without it. It thrives in proportion to its observance. The Sabbath was made for man. God made it for men in a certain spiritual state because they needed it. The need, therefore, is deeply hidden in human nature. He who can dispense with it must be holy and spiritual indeed. And he who, still unholy and unspiritual, would yet dispense with it is a man who would fain be wiser than his maker. Close quote. So he says it well. Now it's interesting that the, the setting aside of one day in seven, may, uh, not doing, not observing the Sabbath, may be one of the major sources of tension and stress in our society. We live in a society in which uh, this whole, our whole culture, especially where we're now taxed ourselves into a position where we have, it requires two incomes to survive, you know. And uh, as most of you are aware, under the Mosaic Law, there, there are very strict regulations that were laid down, part, part to establish the, making this day different, to establish God's seriousness over it, um, in Exodus 35, we find that failing to observe it was a capital crime. That's getting serious. You know, if you don't keep the Sabbath day, you could be executed. They don't observe that today, fortunately. <laughs> all through the history of the Jews, and the notes accompanying this tape will have all the re- a lot of references, not all, but a lot of the references in Isaiah, Jeremiah, elsewhere of these things. And uh, we should probably pick up one or two of them. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah 30, excuse me, uh, Exodus 35. Let's just see it. Let's just examine a couple of these to get the flavor of them. Exodus 35, verses 2 and 3. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be, uh, shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Kindle no fire. Even today, there's all kinds of elaborate preparations in a Jewish household so that they won't light a fire on the Sabbath day. If you're visiting Israel in a hotel, one of the things that you do if it's Saturday or Shabbat from Friday night on, before you get in the elevator, you look to see if it's the Sabbath elevator because they believe, they're taught, they're, they're, they observe that pushing a button is work. So they don't even, they go so far as not even wanting to touch a button, which means that it's an elevator. You've got a, you know, a 20-story hotel or something. They'll have an elevator. It stops at every floor. That's the Sabbath elevator. The more progressive hotels will have two, one that stops at the odd floors, one at the even floors. At least you can cut the number of stops in half if you're up there on the 14th floor or wherever. 
what you always want to do is you look around, you'll find one of the elevators is not programmed Sabbath, and that's the one you want, so you can push 14 and go directly to 14 and not have to go through 14 stops or whatever. They call that Sabbath elevator. And, and, and from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, that's the way these, the hotels are required to offer. By the way, there's some exceptions, though. Even in ancient Israel, that was the tabernacle. The priests carried on their duties in the tabernacle, Leviticus 24, 8, Numbers 28, 9, elsewhere. The temple later was full of activities, all kinds of activities. First Chronicles 9 and 23, you can find that all through the Chronicles to talk about it. Now, to give you some perspective here, this is a perspective that even Jesus calls attention to. If you gave circumcision to a newborn child on what day? The eighth day. Now, we know from modern medical analysis, there are clotting factors and so forth that increase to 110% on the eighth day and then get back, go back to normal. And if you do it on the seventh day or the ninth day, there's more risk. The eighth day is medically the, if you're going to circumcise, that's the day you do it. It's optimum from a, from a clotting point of view. And I'm always wondering, I can understand how we know that today because we plot the, what is it, the vitamin B, whatever it is, and the thrombin and all this stuff. I've always wondered how did Moses know that? Trial and error? You know, I don't really... Uh, so, uh, but anyway, if the, if the eighth day of the, from the birth of the child was on a Sabbath day, they circumcised on the Sabbath day. So that was not considered, in, that was not considered uh, profaning the Sabbath to do something that needed to be done on that day. Follow me? And Jesus makes a point of that later in John 7, we'll see. But of course, the, as you can probably gather, is the perversity of man of all kinds, not just the Jews, but all of us are so perverse, they quickly uh, perverted the Sabbath by traditions. They added all kinds of things to it. And Isaiah condemned the hypocrisy of the worshipers in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But what's most, probably most significant is that uh, you might turn to Isaiah 58. Isaiah interprets it for us more relevantly perhaps to us in chapter 58 picking up about verse 13, last two verses of that chapter chapter 56 by the way, won't take the time but most of 56 also uh, emphasizes the, the, the importance of the Sabbath but chapter 58 verse 13 and 14 Isaiah says, or God says through Isaiah if thou turn away from uh, thy foot from the Sabbath from doing any pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The real emphasis in Isaiah is that he defined true Sabbath keeping as turning away from one's own ways and own pleasures and taking a delight in the Lord. Picking a day and focusing on the Lord. Learning about Him, praising Him, uh, so forth. Now other prophets also protested the abuse of the Sabbath. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 17, Ezekiel in chapter 22, Amos in chapter 8. And uh, they regarded the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivities of the Jews do, at least in part, to the desecration of the Sabbath. That's in Jeremiah 17 and Ezekiel 20. Something you might know, they went to, when, when they went into the Babylonian captivity, they went into captivity for 70 years. Do you know why it was 70 years? Because for 70 years they failed to keep the Sabbath of the land. I've changed subject. We're not talking about the Sabbath of the man. The Sabbath of the man was six days you worked, seventh year rest. The Sabbath of the land is six years you plowed the land, seventh year rest. But they failed to do that. And in 2 Chronicles 36, 20 and 21, it tells you the reason that God, God says, in effect, you owe me 70. Because for 490 years, they'd failed to keep that law. So God collected what he felt was due him. He took it seriously. Now, uh, Hosea predicted that God would make Israel's Sabbaths to cease because of her unfaithfulness. That's in Hosea 2, verse 11. But this cessation of the Sabbath observance was not meant to be permanent because we find in Isaiah 66 that uh, it would return and in Ezekiel 44. But we'll talk about that again a little later in the study. Now during the exile, after the exile, they go to Bab they, they, when they're in Babylon, the temple's destroyed, they finally get released after 70 years, they go back. And uh, during the Babylon captivity, the concept of the Sabbath increased in ceremonial prominence because, because it was not dependent upon a temple. So many, much of their life was centered around the temple. There was no temple, they were slaves. But the Sabbath was something they could do wherever they were, so it increased and it's, it scaled up in its importance. 
when they finally uh, get uh, released and go back to the, uh, 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 the land, Nehemiah ultimately is shocked to see how they are, haven't followed through on all this uh, the temple, and especially the desecration of the Sabbath day. He takes all kinds of steps, and that's in, there, that's in Nehemiah 13. You can follow through on that. So under the reaction to their failing to keep it was the emergence of all kinds of additional codes and rules to emphasize its uh, proper observance, all kinds of regulations and restrictions. Now, this was so successful in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah that when you get to the intertestamental period, um, the days of the Maccabees, the revolt against the Greeks and so forth, many chose to die rather than desecrate the Sabbath. By the time you get to the oppression under, the, under Antiochus, Epiphanes and all that, which of course led to the Maccabean revolt, um, as part of the, the, reading the Torah was a capital crime and uh, observing the, the Sabbath, you know, he, the Seleucid uh, rulers were really, uh, he was really oppressive. They would rather die than desecrate the Sabbath. That's impressive. In fact, Matthias, the leader of the revolt against the tyranny of Antiochus IV, ruled that it was permissible to take up arms in self-defense on the Sabbath, 1 Maccabees 2.41. He actually had to make a ruling so they understand, yes, you could fight on the Sabbath day. They were that committed to it. But anyway, as the rules multiplied, uh, so did the, the gimmicks to circumvent the rules. And uh, all kinds of far-fetched ruses, I won't go through those. Uh, uh, Alfred Adersheim's book deals, deals with a lot of those, Templates, Ministry and Services. And uh, no, you can't legislate devotion, and that's the intent of, of the Sabbath day. So this first segment of our study is really just attempted to sort of survey the concept of Shabbat concept of Saturday as the holy day. And I think one of the things that uh, we should recognize is that it's not restricted to being instituted by the Ten Commandments. In fact, in the Ten Commandments, when it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, even the grammar tells you it was already understood, you're just held to remember it. And so uh, it, it implies right there it was already pre-existing. So it's, it's not uniquely Jewish. It's uniquely Jewish in the sense that it was embodied in the Mosaic Code. It's uniquely Jewish in the sense that they were required to follow it. But it was instituted, I believe, as early as Eden. And uh, uh, because many of the idioms of the Torah, the five books of Moses, we find echoed in advance, if you will, uh, in Eden. Whether it's the clean and unclean issues, whether it's the idea of the offerings, whether it's the predictive offerings of the... Uh, of the uh, Messiah to be offered uh, on the cross. Okay, well that's okay, but here we are, most of us in this room, worship, our special day of acknowledgement of the Lord is on Sunday. One of the things that also, I mentioned the intertestamental period after they came back from Babylon, was the rise of the synagogue, even though they, even when they built their temple finally, they still had this, uh, the synagogue became the center of religious life in Jerusalem, even when the temple was there and so forth. And attendance was customary on the uh, Sabbath day. We find that uh, Jesus uh, announced his ministry in the, in, in the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath day. We'll find that he never, he always did a lot of things on the Sabbath day. And because why? He was Jewish. So they, they did, that was in fact the cultural pattern. He was, of course, obedient to the law. One of the things we'll find as we get into the New Testament period is that this, the formalism, the rigor of it, is, uh, had lost sight of what it was set out to do. And so it, the appearance you get is that Jesus is in conflict with their concept of the Sabbath. So we'll, in that conflict, we'll get a feeling for what should be a proper balance. And that's where our difficulty is, because all of us in here have been taught, gee, Sunday is our Sabbath. Well, the Sunday is not the seventh day of the week, and the seventh day of the week is what's emphasized in Genesis. Is that important or not? Don't know. Everyone has to be, uh, resolve this in their own mind. Where did we get this notion? Why do we worship on Sunday? Are we not keeping the Sabbath day by worshiping on Sunday? Or are we? Uh, those are all issues. Does a Christian have to keep the Sabbath in the Old Testament sense is a question. And uh, what about the Ten Commandments? Is a Christian supposed to keep the Ten Commandments? We're not under the law, but are we supposed to keep the Ten Commandments? One of the commandments is to keep Shabbat. Is Sunday the Shabbat? That's an issue. And if, so, when, if Sunday replaced Saturday, when did that happen? Where's the text? Where's the authority for that? And perhaps the biggest surprise of all to me, as I started to get into this, see, I, I maintain that anyone that thinks this is a simple issue hasn't studied it. 
And I just decided after being troubled with it for many, many years, I thought, I'm just going to try to do a little digging on my own. Again, I've heard the Seventh-day Adventist arguments, and some of them are kind of interesting. Some of them are, are contrived, in my opinion. But at the same time, there's, as you get into this, it's not a, anyone thinks it's simple, hasn't studied it. But what really turned the tables for me in a certain direction was the fact what prophecy says about Shabbat. Well, we're in our second session, we'll just call it Sunday. And uh, clearly, the Sabbath in the New Testament period is uh, 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 very conspicuous in many, many ways. We recognize in the New Testament period that the true meaning of the Sabbath had been obscured uh, by all, a multitude of these restrictions that were laid upon uh, on the people. And it had largely become external and formal. And uh, so it was inevitable that the Lord, Jesus, would come into conflict with the leadership over the Sabbath. We realize it was Jesus' custom to attend the synagogue on every Sabbath. And we find that in Luke 4, where he actually announces, he reads from Isaiah and, and announces his mandate. It's one of the most dramatic readings in the Scripture. Because he reads this passage from Isaiah and then says, This day is this scripture fulfilled. And basically he's announcing himself as the Messiah. And when you get it, I won't take the time in, our, in the interest of covering our other material to get in the details there. But if you re recognize in Luke 4 when he reads from Isaiah, the passage reading is from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. What you want to do is compare what he read compared to what's in Isaiah and you'll discover he stopped at a comma. He didn't finish a sentence that's in Isaiah. He stopped at a comma closed the book and said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in years. What he read, a verse and a half, was all the details of his first coming, his ministry, healing the sick and so forth. The part he did not read is very provocative. And the day of vengeance of our God. And that's the describes his second coming. He will fulfill that too. But it's it, that, that comma, as we would call it, in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2, has lasted 2,000 years. But just as certain as he came the first time, He's going to return. And when he returns, he has a whole different agenda. Anyway, the fact that Jesus is in the synagogue, as you read the Gospels, all of them, they, all, they all make reference to that. But one of the things you should be sensitive to, that in his teaching, Jesus upheld the authority and the validity of the Old Testament law. And uh, let's just take a look at Matthew 5. Obviously, we could take many, many passages to emphasize that. I'm just, I'll just pick a few. But Matthew 5 is a conspicuous one. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the Torah, or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, not one, uh, one yacht or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now, a yacht or a tittle are he uh, Hebrew terms. A yacht looks to you, you and I would mistake it for an apostrophe. It happens to be one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but it's a yacht. It's, a, it's like a little apostrophe, little, it, almost like a little ink mark. A tittle is the little decorative hook on certain letters. So I don't, it, it, the way you would probably paraphrase this in the English is as if Jesus said, not, not the crossing of the T or the dotting of an I will pass till all be fulfilled. And by the way, I think this has much more implication than most people realize. I believe that Jesus took the Bible very, very literally. And uh, that enters into a whole other debate. Let's keep moving. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. I want you to picture the crowd. Who do you think was in the back row? These guys. They were not overjoyed with this teacher exp expressing this perspective. And we tend to knock the scribes and the Pharisees. Let me tell you, these were dedicated people. They took their calling seriously. Admittedly, they may have missed the point on a lot of things, but don't knock them. They tithed one day in seven. And uh, they gave themselves seriously to their attempt to keep the law rigorously. And uh, that was their whole... And to a Jew, that was the ultimate, to be a scribe or a Pharisee. I mean, these guys were the professional law keepers. 
And for Jesus tells them, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. What a blow to the Jew. Serious stuff here. Serious. So Jesus upheld the authority of the Old Testament law. There's lots of other places in Matthew 15 and 19 and 22. Uh, let's, take, let's take a look at Matthew 22. That, uh, I, won't, I won't try to take all of these or we'll be here beyond uh, a lot of time. This is a famous passage in, in, in Matthew 22, verse, starting about verse 35 to about verse 40. Uh, then one of them, who was a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. There are many that will use this, and maybe not, in, not inappropriately, as the primary focus for all of our lives. The, re, the real enigma then comes in, in, in the implication of, both, of the two great commandments. Now, Jesus' emphasis, while he, he underscored the validity of the law, his emphasis was not on the external observance of the law, but on the spontaneous performance in pursuit of the will of God that underlay the law, that under, was underneath it. In Matthew 5 and 19, there's plenty of passages in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere that deals with that. And, uh, but perhaps the key verse to our subject tonight is in Mark 2.27. Jesus clarifies the true meaning of the Sabbath by showing the original purpose for its institution. What was in God's heart? What was God's desire here? Jesus says in, Matthew, in Mark 2.27, The Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. And that's his rebuttal to these rigorous rules and burdens that had trammeled the society. And, and in so doing, totally lost the concept of what the Sabbath was instituted for. Now, as you read the Gospels, you quickly discover it's almost as if Jesus went out of his way to antagonize these guys. Because he seemed to just look for things he could do on the Sabbath day to get them upset. I don't really believe he did that. I suspect he did it on many occasions. Uh, by the way, the assertion by some, that, uh, some of the people that like to, to emphasize this aspect of it, that Jesus only healed on the Sabbath day, that's not true. Well, there are some verses I'll show you where he healed on other days too. And I suspect he did it every day. The ones that he did on the Sabbath day are recorded because they led to a, to a confrontation that, was, that would be illuminating. You might turn to Matthew 12. Uh, in one of these famous confrontations. Matthew 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the grain fields, and his disciples were hungry, and began to pluck the ears of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, by the way, that was not stealing. That was part of the culture. You know, a, a stranger could do that. There were circumstances in which that was appropriate. But anyway, the, the problem here is that it was a Sabbath day. If you were the grain, you know, the field owner, you weren't supposed to harvest on that day. And, uh, uh, but they're just walking, they're just hiking through, and they, 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 so they took some to eat. Verse 2, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto them, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and, and, that, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God. And did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them who were with him, but only for the priests. What he's referring to is the, uh, uh, the tabernacle. The temple hadn't been built yet. Psalm was yet coming. The tabernacle. In the tabernacle, as you, there was the outer court, one gate. As you enter that gate, you, there was this, this sort of portable building thing. And as you entered it, you, act, if you, you had a room that was like... Uh, uh, two cubes long. There's a fine, like if you visualize three cubes, uh, one room being two cubes long, the third one being the Holy of Holies. But as you enter this first holy place, as they called it, to the left was the menorah, the, the, the uh, uh, lampstands, sometimes called candlestick through an uncomfortable, unfortunate translation of the King James, but it's an uh, oil bearing lampstand, seven lights on it. And uh, to the right was the table of showbread, or table of its presence, sometimes called. And they had 12 loaves of bread there, changed every Shabbat. One loaf for each of the twelve tribes is the, concept, is the symbolism there. And then always associated to the inside of the Holy of Holies, but technically outside, is the golden altar, the altar of incense. 
And a lot of confusion because it sounds like it's inside, but it can't be tended then because no one can go in the Holy of Holies except the high priest and only once a year and only after great ceremonial preparation. So that's, the, that's where the priests did their thing. Now, a, a non-priest wasn't even supposed to go in there, number one, and certainly not help themselves to the bread, you see. And Jesus is pointing out, David, that he was in flight for his life. He and his men. They needed provisions. So they went in there and grabbed it and went on. And Jesus points out, uh, have you not read that David did when he was hungry and they were with him, how he entered the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them who were with him, but only for priests. Jesus is making a distinction between ceremonial law and moral law. You see, doing what's needful, violating those rules because of the exigency of the flight for life, speaks for itself. You see, he goes on, he says, Or have you not read, verse 5, in the law, that uh, how on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you, that are in this place is one greater than the temple. That ought, if they were upset before, now they are upset. Okay, And he's going to make reference to this in his trial. Destroy this temple and I'll raise it up. That comes up in the trial. They misunderstood. They said he's going to destroy the temple in three days. No, he's speaking of the temple of his body. In the remark that he subsequently makes that gets quoted at his trial. But if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. There it is again. And so that was one of the first of these, well not first, but any one of these conflicts. It's also recorded in Mark 2 and Luke 6. But you see, the main point is Jesus here puts the Sabbath commandment in the category of ceremonial law. That's going to be, not going to be material to our doctrine we'll come to, but I do want to make that point. Human need has precedence over the ceremonial requirements. That's, the, I believe, the, the inference here. Now, in, in John 7, we have to look it up. Uh, Leviticus 12.3 uh, indicates that you can circumcise a male child on the Sabbath day, should it, should it be required to do that. In John 7, uh, Jesus makes uh, an allusion to that very issue. And, of course, Jesus asserted his lordship over the Sabbath. We just saw it here in M- Matthew 12.8, also Mark 2.28, and, and Luke uh, 6.5. Now, you might turn with me to... Uh, let's, well, right here, let's take, the, take this version that's right here. Continuing here, starting at verse um, 9 in Matthew 12. When he was departed from there, he went into their synagogue. Behold, there was a man who had his hand paralyzed. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might accuse him. See, they're ready for him now. He's going to do, it, you can do something like that. You can break the law. Here's, you know, this is one of those things where you could argue, I imagine in their mind, you could do that tomorrow, you don't have to do it today. You know, I mean, why do it on a Sabbath day? Anyway, verse 11. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will, not, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much, then, is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath days. And then he said to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. He stretched forth, and it was restored well like the other. Now, I want you to notice how grateful and impressed the Pharisees were in verse 14. And the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. And, uh, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, and my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I'll put my spirit upon him, and he shall show justice to the Gentiles. And he shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. And it goes on quotes from Isaiah. And uh, there's another episode similar to this. Uh, There's a lot of these, but in fact there's uh, about uh, seven of them. But let's take Luke 13. Let's find our way over to Luke 13. There's another episode that we might just take a look at starting about verse 10 and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath if it was the Sabbath you'd expect Jesus to be in the synagogue verse 11 and behold there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together hunched up and could in no way lift herself up and when Jesus saw her he called her to him and said unto her woman thou art loosed from thine infirmity he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight 
and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. I can't get over these guys. Um, they want to try? I don't know. Uh, anyway, and said to the people, There are six days in which men ought to work in them. Therefore come and be healed, but and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered and said, Thou hypocrite, Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from his bond on the Sabbath day? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. It's strange on the reaction of people to these things. Uh, you remember La the raising of Lazarus? It wasn't not a Sabbath issue, but I'm always intrigued when Lazarus. Remember when Lazarus was, was definitely dead? Everybody knew it, and he calls Lazarus forth and raises him. You know what the reaction of the Pharisees were? Yeah, they had a plot to kill him. They couldn't have him running around, and uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, amazing. There are actually seven of these healings on the Sabbath day. Uh, the demoniac on, uh, in Capernaum in Mark 1, Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum in Mark 1, the impotent man in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, John 5, first nine verses, the man for the withered hand we just read, it was there in, Mar in Matthew 12, but also Mark 3, the woman bowed together is in Luke 13 as well as uh, Matthew here, the man with dropsy in Luke 14, and the man born and blind in John 9. In each of these instances, Jesus demonstrates that human need is placed above the cer external ceremonial observance of the Sabbath. And, uh, but you know, it's interesting. He never did or said anything to suggest that he intended to take away from man the privileges afforded by that day of rest. There's a difference between instructing them on how it should properly, you know, the, the, the license they had to do good, rather than observe all these ceremonial uh, restraints, on the one hand, but he doesn't—he doesn't obliterate the Sabbath day. He doesn't. There's no evidence in my mind that he—he he, uh, it takes away the privilege of the Sabbath day. Recognize it was made for man. He doesn't take it away. Now, the, the, the assertion is made by some who argue that he only healed on the Sabbath. Not true. In Mark chapter one, verse thirty-two, uh, he was—he healed on a Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. Not making a big thing of it, except to notice that he didn't uh, const, you know, restrain himself to do it only on the Sabbath day. Well, let's shift from Jesus to Paul. Let's talk a little bit about Paul and the Sabbath. Let's realize that the early Christians in large measure were Jews. And, so they, and they were loyal Jews. They worshipped daily at the temple in Jerusalem. We find that in Acts 2 and Acts 5. They attended services in the synagogue in Acts 9, 13, 14, 17, uh, 18, and so on. They revered the law of Moses. In fact, to a fault. That leads to a whole another issue. In fact... A big dispute emerges in the first, what, 20 years of the church history when Gentiles were being saved. Paul was arguing, you know, that, uh, and Paul and Peter both recognized that the, the gospel was reaching out to Gentiles. Now, the pattern prior to Jesus was that if you were a Gentile, you could proselyte into Judaism. You could become a converted Jew, so you could convert to Judaism. And if so, you could enter the, what's called the court of the Gentiles in the temple. If you're just a Gentile, you couldn't. But if you're a proselyte, you could. And so naturally, when Jesus came and the gospel was preached and so forth, the Jewish mind assumed that, gee, the way you become a Christian is to proselyte to Judaism and then accept Christ and you're a, a, you know, a Christian Jew. And both Paul and Peter point out that they did not, a Gentile did not have to put himself under Judaism to become a Christian. Big debate. So much so, they have this huge bruja which leads to what we call the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. And uh, we might turn to that because it's a very pivotal point about a lot of issues in, in Acts chapter 15. The big, the, there's actually two issues here, but most people don't recognize the second one. Verse 1, A certain men who came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Circumcision isn't the only issue. That's just idiomatic of the whole thing, the whole uh, uh, burden of being a Jew. And when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation among them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. 
and being brought on, brought on their way by the church, they passed through a bunch of places. I'll c- c- cut through some of this. Anyway, they get together. At verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And uh, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's referring to Acts 10, the, the incident at Cornelius' home and all that. But verse 8 continuing, And God, who knoweth the hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. And he meaning Peter's talking about these Gentiles. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why put God to the test to put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? And I love verse 11. Notice the ellipsis that Peter throws in here. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. He doesn't say, gee, they'll be saved just like we are. Look at us. He turns it around. He hopes that they'll, we'll be saved just like they were, these Gentiles. We had the Holy Spirit and all this. Yeah. Interesting rhetorical device there. I like that. Notice the contrast between Peter before in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. Two different guys. In the Gospels, Peter is clumsy. The only time he opens his mouth is to change feet. He's always putting his foot. You know, he, he's, he, he's, he, he's always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. In Acts, read his speech, not only in Acts 2, but in Acts 3. Eloquent, organized, articulate. You want to see evidence of the Holy Spirit, infill, in, infilling the Spirit. Just look at Peter's life. Very interesting. But anyway, uh, they, 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 uh, verse 12, The multitudes kept silence, listened to the Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God hath wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they held their peace, James, this is the Lord's brother, didn't, was not a believer before the resurrection, not only became a believer, but the head of the church in Jerusalem, answered and said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. And then he quotes from Amos 9. Simeon that declared how God first did visit the nations and take out a people for his name. And to this agree, the words of the prophets is written. Oh, here's where he quotes, yeah, Amos 9. After this I will return. See, first a people is called out. See, Simeon has declared how God first did visit the nations to take a people out of the name. Then after this, he says in Amos, God says, I will return. And we'll, be, uh, we'll build again the tent or the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And we'll build again its ruins and we'll set it up. And the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the nations upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, doeth these things. Known unto God are all his works in the beginning of the age. So here's what he says. James says, Wherefore my judgment is that we trouble not them who are among the Gentiles who uh, return to God. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and and from things strangled and from blood. And Moses' old time hath, and and he goes on, he he makes his case. When you get, they they agree to write letters in verse 23, and and you'll notice that in verse 24, here are the terms. For as much as we have heard that certain who went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled in one accord, to send chosen men unto you, and so forth. You get down here to um, verse 27. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who also tell... This is being promoted to all the churches from Jerusalem. Then. Um, the same things by mouth. Verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay up on you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. From which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare thee well. You notice what's not mentioned there? No circumcision, no Sabbath day, no lots of other things. Just those essentials. Interesting. Key part of it. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, is clear is you read the writings of Paul, and we could spend a good bit of time on this one. Paul regarded the yoke of the law a bondage from which... The Christian was set free. And clearly, probably the principle, uh, it's in many of his epistles, but especially the book of Galatians. The whole book of Galatians is a, a call out of religious externalism of whatever kind. Not just the Jewish, although that's part of the issue, the one we're talking about here, but any form of legalism. Yeah, that's what Paul tries to get through with, with uh, Galatians. And certainly the book of Romans. You can't go through the book of Romans competently and not realize that the whole theme is our liberty in Christ. That Christ fulfilled the law for us. Now there are ways to abuse that liberty. That's a whole other issue. But we are not under the law. 
Major, major emphasis. It's interesting, Paul made no distinction between moral and ceremonial law. He lumped them all together. They were all part of that old covenant which was done away in Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.14 other passages. Colossians 2.14, it was nailed to the cross. People who do not understand the dangers or the threat of legalism don't understand what happened at the cross. That's the key to the whole thing. And it's the simplest thing and yet the most difficult thing to get across our liberty in Christ, that Christ did the whole job. We can't add to it. To try to add to it is blasphemy. That's the real issue that lurks under the Saturday-Sunday dispute. Is not Saturday or Sunday. We'll come to that. But uh, the real issue is, are we under the law or not? Once you, once you put it in those terms, then the Scripture is clear. It's interesting, Paul also talks about the Sabbath among the festivals and new moons, all of which are a shadow of things. Turn to Colossians 2.16 and 17. And this is the one you may want to mark and memorize. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Very key verses. Paul is laying it right out for us. This is, one, this is a key verse you want to mark. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect of a feast day or of a new moon or of a what? A Sabbath day, which are but a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. This is a climax of a whole tour de force that starts way back in verse 9, how the believer is complete in Christ. I won't go back to verse 9, but let's pick it, pick it up, what Christ has done. Oh, let's start about um, verse 12, I guess. It's hard where to start. You can, the whole thing is a flow here. Uh, speaking of how you and I are buried with Him in baptism, in which also ye are risen with Him through faith in the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And what did He do with them? Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, those are ranks of angels, the dark side. Uh, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect of any feast day or of the new moon or of a Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. One of the most interesting studies you should undertake if you haven't done so yet is to study the feasts of Israel. The feasts of Israel. There are seven mosaic feasts. They are, each one are historically embedded. They arise, they arise from Israel's history. But each one is also prophetic in some amazing ways. And I don't have the time to even give a quick summary here. There are seven of them, three in the first month, three in the seventh month, and one in between. The first three are prophetic of his first coming. The last three in the seventh month are prophetic of his second coming. The one in between is a really weird of all of them, and it speaks of the church. It speaks of leavened bread, straight. You only feast in the Torah with leavened bread. Interesting study. Every detail of them is prophetic, and I encourage you to get a, a competent guide and go through that. We do have a briefing pack called Feasts of Israel, which will take you through them if you're so inclined. But what is really, this is, it's a springboard from verse 17. All these things, the Sabbaths, the, the Jewish calendar, they say the, Jew, the Jews' catechism is his calendar. If you really understand the Jewish calendar, there's more prophetic relevance to that calendar. And one of these is the Sabbath and the uh, Sabbath rest. We'll come to that in a minute. But the first point here is, if you observe the days and the months and the seasons and the years... You are slaves to weak spirits. Galatians 4, verse 9 and 10 deals with this. Colossians 2.20 deals with this. The observance of days is characteristic of someone who is weak in the faith. Now that may sound strange to you. Some of you are still fresh from our Roman study. But let's go ahead anyway and turn to Romans 14. And let's just read... First, oh, let's read the first five verses together. Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak, 
eateth herbs. It's a vegetarian. I want you to notice something. Who's the stronger and who's the weaker? There are some people that have chosen to observe restrictions. There are others that ignore the restrictions. Which one's stronger in faith? By Paul here. He's arguing to the, the, the church, the, the, the believers in Rome. He that is weak in the faith, receive him. But not too doubtful, not, not, for, not to argue with. Doubtful distributions. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another eateth herbs. Some, some believe he can eat anything, some people are vegetarians. Now he's assuming the vegetarian thing here is a religious thing. You can, you can be a vegetarian because you happen to... There, there, there are good reasons you may want to be a vegetarian that have nothing to do with your belief structure in terms of the scripture. Don't misunderstand me. But here he's talking in that context. Who's the weaker? The one that eats everything or the one that denies himself some things? Who's the weaker one? The one that's denying and putting himself under some restrictions. Verse 3, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be held up, for God is able to make him stand. Now here's verse 5, the key verse you may want to mark it. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Does that sound like Paul is enfor enforcing the Sabbath on Gentiles? I don't think so. He's making just the opposite point. Let's go to verse 6. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Then he goes on to make his whole case, and, and that's the uh, whole flavor of 14 and 15, the book of Romans. Now, there is a view, and you can defend the view, that to a Christian, every, every day is holy. And that's a, that's a great line. It should be. Every day is holy. On the one hand. On the other hand, the concept of the Sabbath was a day where you set aside your own interests, and you really focus on the Lord's. You can't do that every day. It's called renting groceries and stuff, you know, okay? But the idea is one, one day in seven, you really focus and uh, on Him. That's the, that was the concept. But the first point is there's no grounds for imposing the Sabbath on the Christian who is free from the burden of the law's demands. In the Colossians passage, he says that he's taken the handwritings of the ordinances that were against us and nailed it to the cross. Another way of translating that, I think in New American Standard, one of the other says the same thing, the certificate of debt. And that becomes a little clearer. And uh, there is a procedure in their culture you need to understand. That when you were, if you were um, convicted of a crime by a court, you owed society a debt. And they literally drew up a certificate of debt. And you were put in prison. And uh, that record was kept with the jailer. And let's assume you'd been sentenced, say, to five years. Just pick a rhetorical device. Present for five years. As you, as you ticked off your years, that would be recorded on your certificate of debt. When you finished your five years, they would write across your certificate of debt, paid in full, and hand it to you when you were freed. And you kept that as a valuable paper because that was your protection against je double jeopardy. You could never be tried for that crime again. You'd paid your debt to society. That's where we get those idioms. It's from that ancient Greco-Roman culture. Now, there's another side to this. Let's assume that you'd served two of your years of your five and you escaped. Who do you think gets hooked for the three missing years. The jailer. And that's why the Roman soldiers were going to kill all the passengers in Acts 27 that were on that shipwreck before they hit the land. The centurion wouldn't let them, of course. Um, that's why the Philippian jailer, when he heard the things were all empty, he was going to kill himself. And Paul said, no, we're all still, we're still here, singing hymns and stuff. It freaked him out. He, came, he, he changed his eternal destiny over that whole issue. When Jesus hung on the cross... One of his last words were, to tell us die, is the way it's recorded in the, in the Greek, which is translated in John 19, it is finished. One Greek word, to tell us die. It's legitimately translated, it is finished. It's just as legitimately translated, paid in full. That's what they wrote across your certificate of debt, to tell us die, paid in full, hand it to you. Your debt and mine is paid in full at that cross. Back then. Still. 
Even when you screw up next week, paid in full. So you have liberty in Christ. Not a liberty, not, not a liberty to abuse, but you are freed from the law. Why? Because it was nailed to the cross with him. That's the whole point of the book of Romans. If that's wrong, throw away all Paul's epistles, all of them. Because they all deal with that in one way or another. Now, um, he says these things are a shadow of things to come. You caught that phrase in Colossians, right? 117. How is the Sabbath a shadow of things to come? That's recorded in the first 11 verses of the book of Hebrews, naturally. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4, first 11 verses. This is the shadow of things to come from the Sabbath. I'm getting ahead of this to make sure we cover this. Then I'll cover some other things. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. I believe the book of Hebrews is written by Paul. That's not material to this argument. So I'll mention it in passing so you at least know where I'm coming from. But uh, Hebrews 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, quote, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, And God did rest on the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, he says, If they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, again he limiteth a certain day, saying, David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day, there remaineth a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, there's much more here than we can deal with. We really need to get into the whole context of the, the epistle of, uh, of, of the Hebrews. But the point is, the Sabbath is also a type, a spiritual foreshadowing of a rest. And not a one day and seven issue, but a permanent rest in Christ. Not the whole story, but a key part of the story is you enter into that rest when you finally realize that your works, anything you might do, is valueless. The only thing that has merit is that which the Holy Spirit does through you. That's a hard idea to get across. Paul works hard at that in most of his epistles. It's climaxed here in Hebrews for a number of reasons. But once you trust Christ that much, then you can enter into that rest. Because it's not your effort, it's His that accomplishes your benefit. And that's really a quick, clumsy summary of that rest that Hebrews here is talking about, of which the Sabbath is a foreshadowing prophetically, typologically. So, but let's, okay, we've talked about the Sabbath again. Let's get back to the, the uh, first, you know, the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. How did Sunday, the first day of the week, become a Sabbath? Has God authorized this change? And if so, where? When? When do you do this? There's obviously a distinction between the seventh day itself and the institution of the Sabbath. And uh, the question of which day doesn't really uh, affect this, the, uh, the perpetual obligation of the Sabbath as an institution. Change of the day or no change, one way or the other, Sabbath remains a sacred institution. It can't be abrogated. However, you're going to play around with it. People say, well, gee, we're not sure which is Saturday and Sunday. I won't buy that, but that's, neither, that's not the issue. The real issue is the, is the Sabbath. And if any change was made, it's my view that it ha would have to be made by Christ. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. And part of my problem is I can't find any record where he explicitly does that. He, he's the only one that has a right to make that change, it's obvious. Now, as the Creator, he was the Lord of the Sabbath. He, he was the one that instituted it in the first place. John 1.3 and Hebrews 1.10 and elsewhere. It was originally a memorial of the creation, and that hasn't changed. Still the creation, he's, it's still a memorial of the Creator. Now, the argument is advanced with some validity that there's even a greater event than the creation that's been accomplished, and that's the redemption. Your redemption in mind is a far greater achievement by God than the creation. Well, that's a wild statement. How do I justify that view? It doesn't mean I'm right, but how, do I, how would I justify that view? Well, a couple of ways. One way I determine how important something is is how much space in the Word of God is devoted to it. 
Well, it's like a creator. Let's take the creation. That's pretty neat. You got a couple of chapters in Genesis, right? You got a few Psalms, a couple of key chapters, a couple of chapters in Job, a couple of chapters in uh, Isaiah. And that's about it. There's some verses here and there. That's the creation. The other, well, let's talk about the redemption. The whole book of Genesis sets the stage for the redemption. That's what the book of Exodus is really getting into, the Passover lamb and all that stuff. And Leviticus, that's all the details. And Deuteronomy, <laughs> Numbers, the historical history of Israel, climax. You've got the Psalms, you've got um, <laughs> the prophets, major, minor, whatever. Redemption, God's climax. Look at the Gospels. What are the Gospels all about? Our Redeemer. Paul's epistles. And of course, the climax is the, the, is the book of Acts 2, namely Revelation. <laughs> Most of the Bible is on the redemption. There's another way to measure importance, and that's look at the price tag. What did the creation cost God? He breathed it out of his nostrils. It took him six days. And some people, you know, if you want to argue that one, why did it take him so long? You know, I mean. Well, let's talk about the redemption. What did it cost him? cost him his son. He actually had to go to death. He allowed man to get in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God would extricate him. We have no ability to grasp what that means. We have a breathing back called the agony of love. How do you compress eternity into six hours on the cross? And you can't do it. There's a, there's a whole issue there you can study. So the redemption, uh, some would argue with some validity that the, the Sabbath memorializes the creation. And some would argue that the Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the validation of God's whole program by the demonstration of victory over death itself. One can build that case, and I think competently. Would the calendar change? Well, the Jewish calendar changed at Passover. In Exodus 12, where all the rules are given out to Passover, which is on the 14th of Nisan, God says in verse 2 of Exodus 12, you shall make this month the beginning of months. In other words, you can change your calendar so Nisan is the first of the year. The Jewish calendar has their new year, Rosh Hashanah, in the fall, September, October, in our calendar. The Nisan is, we're coming into, you know, towards Easter, it's, it's uh, in the spring. The Jews have two calendars, a formal civil calendar, which is the one that was the Genesis calendar, i.e. starts in the fall, and they have the religious calendar, which starts in, at the month of Nisan, because that's the Passover month. And on it goes. So, yes, the, the whole calendar was changed when, at the birth of the nation. So one could argue that our calendar has changed at the birth of the church. You see? Uh, you know, when? On Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. So that's an argument. Now, I don't have any problem with that, except I can't find an explicit written thing in the text. So that makes me a little uncomfortable. I can defend it. I can sell it. But I'm privately a little nervous because I, I don't see a good, crisp place to hang that. Except it is, it is I think, consistent with the spirit of the text in, in, in a broader sense. Well, let's talk about the apostolic. It's always been said that, uh, you know, obviously we celebrate Sunday because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. By the way, I'm not sure he did. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, I believe that he rose after sundown Saturday. They found the empty tomb Sunday morning. So if you really want to quibble, I could wrestle you with on that one, but that's not the issue anyway. Okay. Jesus does appear to his disciples on four occasions. Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2, Luke 24, 1, John 21, 20, verse 1. On Sunday, son, uh, he makes four different appearances. Some, they, they argue that he only appeared to them after his resurrection on Sunday. Not true. In John 20, verse 26, he appeared to them and then appeared eight days later. So one of those wasn't a, sub uh, Shabbat, well, a Sunday, okay? So uh, the, the assertion by the arg argumentatively that he only appears on, on Sunday is, is an inference that doesn't follow the text strictly. So I wouldn't build doctrine on that. There, there's some that try to say that he also, his ascension occurred on a Sunday. Well, that was 40 days from the Emmaus Road experience, from, from, the, from the Resurrection Sunday, and I don't think 40 is divisible by 7 precisely. So I won't quill, quibble, but I think trying to make it out, making the ascension, that number one, they, they haven't convinced me they can make that work that way, but even if they did, it doesn't prove a doctrine. Let's move on. Now, they, the disciples did meet on Sundays. They met on Sunday night in Acts 20, verse 7. 
they always love to point to 1 Corinthians 16, 1, where Paul says, to, uh, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him as in store. Read the next verse, so that you won't take up the collection when I'm with you. <laughs> so I'm not saying that, that, you know, that they didn't meet on Sunday, but it's not clear that that's a pattern you can build doctrine on. And uh, so these are thin arguments in my mind. So, so clearly they did meet on Shabbat, but they also seemed to meet on Sundays frequently, so there was a pattern. Let's talk about the early church. That's a, the, apostolic, the point is the apostolic practice is not clear enough, in my opinion, to try to build doctrine on. It's interesting, but not conclusive. It's inferential. The early church, Ignatius, disciple of the Apostle John, Bishop of Antioch, wrote in the early years of the second century, quote, Be not deceived with strange doctrines, nor with old fables, for if we still live according to Jewish law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace. And then he goes on to categorize his readers as, quote, those who were brought up in the ancient order of things, close quote, but who, quote, have come to the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath. So Ignatius doesn't argue not to observe the Sabbath. Justin Martyr, the first great uh, Christian apologist in the middle of the second century, explains in his dialogue with Trifo why the Christians do not keep the law of Moses or submit to circumcision or observe the Sabbath. He asserts as follows. One, the true Sabbath observance under the new covenant is the keeping of a perpetual Sabbath which consists of turning from sin. I don't know where he gets that, but let's move on. Uh, two, the righteous men of old, Adam, Abel, Enoch, Noah, and the like, pleased God without keeping the Sabbath. I challenge him to prove that. You can't. I think they probably did, for reasons I've already explained. Three, that God imposed the Sabbath upon Israelites because of unrighteousness and hardness of heart. Not true. He ordained that in Eden. So we're beginning to see, even Justin Martyr in the second century, what I would regard as a prejudicial statement rather than a proof. I'll come back to why I make that point in a minute. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, uh, in the latter part of the second century, viewed the Sabbath as symbolical of the future kingdom of God, which it has some validity, in which the man who shall be persevered in serving God shall, in the state of rest, partake of God's table. He cites Abram, who was one who believed in God, quote, without circumcision, without observance of Sabbaths. They're assuming he didn't. There's no proof of that. I think, I think quite the contrary. I think he did observe the Sabbaths. Clement of Ale- but there's no textual proof of that. Clement of Alexandria, writing in the Stromata, the close of the second century, says, uh, the Sabbath by absence from evil seems to indicate self-restraint. That's as far as he went. Tertullian, at the beginning of the third century, says, we have nothing to do with Sabbaths or other Jewish festivals, much less with those of the heathen. In another work, he says that those who would contend for the continued obligation of Sabbath keeping and circumcision must show that Adam and Abel, Noah, Enoch, Melchizedek, and Lot also observed these things. I don't know why. But going. He goes on to say that the Sabbath was a figure of rest from sin, and typical of man's final rest in God. That has some validity. It, together with the other ceremonial regulations of the law, was the only intended to last until a new lawgiver would arise who would, should introduce the realities of those things, of these which were but shadows. And uh, so on it goes. Now, obviously, the Sabbath continues among Christian Jews to the present time. And during the first centuries, the, some Jewish Christians also continued the practice of the seventh day of the week, as well as assembly on the first day of the week. But, there, but now, let me, having said all that, I want to be honest, I quoted from the, those are the primary authorities you'll hear thrown at you about pr- defending the idea that Sunday's okay. I have a problem building any doctrine from the early church. Why do I do that? Because I discover that other than the book of Acts, which is, I believe, rely, obviously reliable, uh, we discover in as early as the uh, late part of the first century that the churches were all screwed up. Because Jesus writes them seven epistles in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And what's interesting about that, in each epistle is a report card for each of the seven churches. Each report card is received by surprise. The guys that thought they were doing great were doing terribly. Two of them had no good things said about them. The ones that were actually thought they were doing terribly were doing great. Two of them had nothing evil said of them. Most of them had some good, some bad. There was a report card. The point I'm making, though, is each one was surprised. So I don't think the church fathers are some kind of authority on doctrine in the sense we're speaking here. And I'll give you some examples. They made some major eschatological errors. The early church had a stream of amillennialism. Origin... Uh, Allegorized his his, uh, epist- his exegesis was allegorical. He had no trouble making things symbolic. Augustine picked that up, and this is in the context of rising anti-Semitism in the early church, an anti-Jewish attitude. That's where you get these blood libels. All these have their roots back there, where the Jews killed our Messiah, Jews the Christ killers, all that nonsense. 
had its roots way, way back there. I would build my doctrine and practice on the Scripture, not some writings of Tertullian or whoever. They're interesting, worth studying, don't misunderstand me, but I wouldn't build my, my faith on them because I, I find all kinds of things that the early church embraced that I know from the Scripture is incorrect. And so I, I share that with a, a you know, skeptical view. So there's a, now let's talk about the so-called Christian Sabbath view. This, this view holds that the Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. Observance of which is a moral obligation based on the fourth commandment of the, uh, of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. This view emphasizes the divine institution of the Sabbath as the, at the close of creation. Um, that uh, God's blessing and sanctification of the seventh day is taken to mean that he intended one day in seven. That's basically the view. To be observed by all men in all ages as a sacred day of rest and worship. And uh, it's regarded as, as a moral com uh, command of a universal and perpetual obligation. It is held that Jesus affirmed that he was Lord even of the Sabbath. Indeed he was. And therefore, he had the authority to change the day of his observance. It is usually held that this change took place during the 40 days between Christ's resurrection and his ascension when he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. That's an inference. There's no explicit. Right? The Sabbatarians insist that Jesus intended to perpetuate the Sabbath and extend his application to all men. Much stress is, of course, put on the statement that the Sabbath is made for man, not man, not man for the Sabbath, as evidence that he regarded the Sabbath as an institution which was grounded in the very constitution of man, which was instituted by God at the very beginning, not only for Israel, but for the whole human race. I think that's correct. That part of it is. The teachings of God, Paul can, regarding the Sabbath are taken to refer to only the Jewish Sabbath and not to the Christian Sabbath. So they, have their, they want their cake and have it too, so to speak. Same thing. And the Bible does teach that God instituted the Sabbath at the close of creation. That was in Genesis. We saw that. The Sabbath is identified as the seventh day. You can't really escape that, honestly. And not as one day in seven. You've got a lot of scriptures that uh, defeat that. And there's both a moral and a ceremonial element in the fourth commandment. The moral element provides for the worship of God. Ceremonial elements only apply to the Israelites, is the argument. Jesus himself treated the ceremonial, uh, the law as ceremonial when he defended the disciples. We went through all that. The basic weakness of this theory is the teaching that a change was made in the day of the week to be observed as the Sabbath. You can't find any evidence of that. There's not the slightest hint in the New Testament that Jesus transferred the Sabbath to another day of the week. If one insists upon the perpetual and universal obligation of the fourth commandment, and at the same time, recognize that there's no New Testament ground for a change in the day of its observance. The only logical position to which one is forced is to maintain that the seventh day of the week, and not the first day, should be observed the Sabbath, as the fourth commandment stipulates. And this is the position taken by the seventh-day Sabbatarians and several versions of those. And uh, Sabbatarianism is the doctrine of Christians who believe that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath, to be observed in the context of the, uh, the fourth commandment. Now, in its strictest form, it was the creation of the Scottish and English reformers especially John Knox. The Scottish Presbyterians and the Puritans brought their views to the colonies where their rigorous blue laws were enforced. Christians who believe that the Sabbath should still be observed on Saturday are sometimes called Sabbatarians. Now the seventh day Sabbath view, that's a different variation. So you're going to discover I don't hold either one of these. This view is held by the seventh day Baptists who originated in England in the 17th century and the Seventh-day Adventists who originated in America in the 19th century. They insist that the Christians are obligated to keep the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. They regard the Ten Commandments as the law of God, as distinguished from the ceremonial laws called the, which they call the law of Moses. They find evidence for the observance of the seventh day in the New Testament. They appeal to the practice of Jesus' and apostles as attending the synagogue on the Sabbath, lots of verses, but of course they were Jewish, they would. They apply Jesus' prophecy regarding the future flight from Jerusalem and his exhortation that they should pray that their flight should not be on the Sabbath day. Matthew 24, 20 it speaks of pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. If they fail to understand that that's yet future, and it's of them who are in Judea. So naturally, that's the Sabbath day is a burden to them. Certainly not to Christians. If we have to flee, we'll flee on Sunday whenever we get a passport or whatever. Right? Okay. So uh, th this is a place where they're building doctrine from a faulty eschatology, or at least not allowing for the possibilities. In other words, that event is post-rapture. It's a whole other issue. They contend, by the way, that the, the passage in Revelation 1, verse 10, remember where John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. They take for granted that the Lord's Day is referring to Sunday because they call Sunday the Lord's Day, don't we all? Uh, and uh, they feel that that's a reference to, a, uh, to the seventh-day sa Sabbath. If you're going to argue that, it's really an argument for the Sunday Sabbath if you want to play that game. But the truth of the matter is, I don't believe either one of those is what John's talking about. I believe he's talking about, I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. Not the Lord's day. As it, there's a difference in, in the rhetorical devices we would translate in English. I believe he's talking about the day of the Lord in the sense of Joel. By the Spirit, he's transported to the day of the Lord and all that that implies. It's not a 24-hour day. It's a period that Joel and all the prophets have a lot to say about. 
That's what Revelation 6 through 19 is a detailing of. Anyway. So anyway, actual evidence of a Sunday worship is circumstantial, they argue, and that's probably true. The uh, uh, distinction is advanced by the Seventh-day Sabbatarians have no direct bib- biblical evidence, unfortunately. That's why there's so much debate. And uh, now, as, as for comp- now, the real d- problem here is the idea of compulsory commitments. Because Paul definitely included the Sabbath command in those ordinances which were done away with with Christ. No question of that. And the, the evidence from the early church leaders that did not really uh, regard Sunday as a continuation, the, you know, these arguments even from the early church, nowhere do they treat Sunday as replacing the Sabbath. There's a difference in concept there. And so uh, later I just came to think of Sunday's bearing an analogy to Hebrew Sabbath, and others called the Christian Holy Day a Sabbath. They grounded the observance more on the authority, authority of the church around the fourth commandment. Let's talk a little about legislation. You can't talk about Sunday without talking about our friend Constantine. Constantine was uh, battling his enemies uh, with his competitors to establish himself on the throne. And on October 27th in 312 A.D., on the eve of the Battle of the Milvane Bridge, outside Rome, he is reported as having seen in this, a vision in the sky, uh, a, a vision of a cross with the words, In this sign, conquer. And uh, so he painted on his men's shields a figure that perhaps was intended to be Christ's monogram. Although some scholars uh, think he may have had Christ confused with the Son in his manifestation of Summa Divinitas, the highest divinity. He won the battle in any case, declared himself a Christian, establishing the turning point in the history of Christianity. And that's, that, that's a matter of history. Whether this was a true conversion or, an, or just a politically advantageous rationalization is a matter of a lot of scholastic dispute. Like his father, he had originally been a votary of the sun god and had gone to worship at the Grand Temple of the Sun in the Vosagas Mountains in Gaul, where he had his first vision, a pagan one, by the way. Many people don't report on that part of it. This may all well have been simply a pragmatic attempt to unify the empire. You need to understand the problem this guy had. He's not ruler, he won this battle, so he's ruler of the world. What's he facing? He was faced with an empire following all kinds of pagan sun worship, several different kinds. The Syrian solar cults of Sol Invictus, which means the unconquerable sun, and the Jupiter Dolichanus, they each had played a very, very key role with the previous rulers. The Persian cult of the ancient Iranian god of light, the Mithra, also had spread throughout the empire. So you got three different groups worshiping the sun throughout this world empire. Now they're developed, of course, what happens in any culture like this, everyone borrows from everybody else, you start melding these things. And they're, they're, they move toward a solar uh, monotheism, to fuse these different elements into a single supreme god of all pagan divinities of the solar gods, Sol, Helios, Serapis, and Mithra. There's four of them, actually. This is the same kind of thing that Muhammad did in Arabia. The Koresh tribe had the franchise to manage the Kaaba, which was the scene of 360 idols. And uh, Al-Ilah, the moon god, was, the lead, was, the, was one of these that Muhammad makes numero uno. And what Muhammad does is redesign this so it's, monothe- it's still paganism, but it's monotheistic under the moon god. Al-Ilah becomes Allah, and the moon, that moon god, the symbol, is on every mosque to this day. But all the pagan, is, uh, pagan forms that preceded even the birth of uh, Islam did not begin with Muhammad. He just repackaged it. But, but it's a very parallel situation in that regard. Now there's another demographic fact you should understand. By the end of the imperial persecutions, which was about 313 A.D., the Christians were an illegal underground sect. They numbered about half the population of the Roman Empire. So embracing this underground sect is just shrewd politics. That's as just, this, just as shrewd as keeping our Boris porous for illegal immigrants as long as they vote Democratic. <laughs> and I'm being a little cynical, but it's a pract- ask anyone who lives in California, they know the problem. Now, Constantine, em- Emperor Constantine uh, served from 306 to 337 A.D. He did a lot of neat things. He abolished slavery. He abolished gladiatorial fights, the killing of unwelcome children. Now, there's progress. And he abolished crucifixion as a form of execution. He was so frustrated with the paganism that clung to the aristocracy of the major families in Rome that he relocated the capital of the world to Byzantium, renaming it like a new Rome, Constantinople. 
Now, by the way, this also may have been motivated by some very strategic insights and economic. Its proximity to the Danube and the Euphrates frontiers and the Straits of the Bosphorus and the eastern commercial routes made it a shrewd move, fundamentally. It was a thousand years, uh, more than about 1,200 years later, that the, by then Islam, because they failed to keep the military up, got overrun by the Moors and it gets, becomes Istanbul and what have you. Now, in 313 A.D., the Edict of Toleration was issued by this Constantine granted to the Christians and all others full liberty in following that religion which each may choose. It was the first edict of its kind in history. Notice he didn't make it a state religion. He just made it legal to become a... If you want to be a Christian, you can do it legally. It was illegal up to then. He made it legal. It was his, the second successor after Constantine that goes even further and makes it a state religion. I'll come back to that. On March 7, 321, Constantine introduced the first civil legislation concerning Sunday. Now, this is eight years later. He makes Sunday the official day of worship for anyone. That all judges and town people in the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. Does that sound Christian? He is unifying these four different sun god uh, myths or legends, whatever, with Christianity. You've got five different groups that will embrace the idea, okay, Sunday's okay, we can use Sunday. In 325, Constantine issued a general exhortation to all his subjects to embrace Christianity. Now, this is 12 years later from the, from the Milvan Bridge episode. He ordered 50 Bibles to be prepared. Those are expensive in those days. They're all hand-done. Under the direction of Eusebius, the first vellum by skillful artists. Very key event in history. By the way, it was the fusing of, the, uh, of Christianity with the extant paganism that December 25th of Saul Invictus became Christmas of the Christians. Most of you do any study in the background here know that most of our traditions around Christmas are pagan transformations. And in his zeal to become the universe, to, for a universal creed, he presided over the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. He wasn't baptized personally until his deathbed on, in 327. So was he a Christian? I don't think so. There are people that defend that. There, there, scholars argue about it. I think he was just a very, very heads up sharp administrator. His later successor, Emperor Theodosius, uh, 347 to 395, who made Christianity the state religion of the empire, and uh, in legislation 380, he affirmed the dogmas of the Council of Nicaea and made church membership compulsory. Biggest disaster for the Christian church imaginable. Um, worst calamity ever befallen the church. He undertook the forcible suppression of all other religions, and in 392 he prohibited paganism. Doesn't that sound great? No. It means you're bringing it all under one, under one tent. huh? So that's begun, that begins the great apostasy where the church then occupies itself with the pursuit of temporal power. And you, to read, if you really want to understand the history of the church, you want to uh, read uh, Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast, which is not only a history, but one of the few that really talks about it prophetically also. Uh, we, Dave and I did a briefing pack together called, if you want just a quick summary of it all, called The Kingdom of Blood, History of the Church. Now, if our perception of Revelation 13, 17, and 18 are correct, the current ecumenical movement that's, that's moving with great momentum throughout the world is going to ultimately lead to the same kind of ecclesiastical tyranny and the darkest ages of all. They don't call those dark ages for nothing when the church ruled. And uh, it's going to, they're going to try to do that again. Hegel was right. He's the Hegel, uh, George Willem Frederick Hegel said, History teaches that man learns nothing from history. And George Santayana expressed another way. He who doesn't know history is destined to repeat it. Let's get at the real issue and wrap this up. Many of us have encountered the zeal of Seventh-day Adventists or, or the like over the Seventh-day issue. And there are many of their observations I've incorporated in this overview. But by the way, it's not the Seventh-day issue that emerges as the theological relevant one. It's the issue of the role of the law and our liberty in Christ. That's the fundamental issue. And interestingly, while there's a lot of fuzziness about Saturday and Sunday, there's no fuzziness of any competence on the issue of our liberty in Christ, because all of Paul's epistles, as a minimum, hammer that home. Epistles of Galatians, Colossians, Romans, far overshadow customs and traditions and, and so forth. I made a list of the specific assertions. I want to make sure I covered all those. I think I have in just the basic texts. But let me talk about the, the nail in the coffin for me. That's not quite, I didn't express that quite right. Let me, because that's usually when I put something down. What really surfaced the issue to me 
is the Bible prophecy. I had never taken the trouble to really tune myself to what happens to the Sabbath prophetically. Uh, remember now, the Sabbath was instituted as part of the creation, Genesis 2. It wasn't intrinsically linked to the law or the Mosaic Covenant, frankly. That, it happened to be included in the law, but that's not what its basis is. Turn to Isaiah 66. When I stumbled into Isaiah 66, I must have read it many times, but I never realized the implications of what it's saying in Isaiah chapter 66, the last chapter of the book of Isaiah, last few verses of it. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. Isaiah says, For as the new heavens and the new earth... When I say, I'll make a new heavens and a new earth, what book do you think I'm quoting from? You'd think Revelation, wouldn't you? No, we're quoting from Isaiah here. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. That's addressed to Israel. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. What? This is millennial or beyond? This is, it shall, it shall come to pass that from one new, the months were always new moon to new moon. In the, that was another Jewish measure. From one new moon to the other, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. All flesh will come to worship the Lord, when? On Shabbat. That's what this says. I, didn't, I never realized it before. Let me give you another example. Let's turn to, turn to um, Ezekiel's temple. Let's turn to Ezekiel 44. Verse 20. Normally take this idea of nakedness as you and I would jump to the conclusion of nakedness, but it may mean far more than that. We infer from other passages that, bear, bear in mind, they, up until then they were sinless. They walked with God. There are some scholars that believe they were clothed with light. The challenge I usually give to a knowledgeable group is they prove to me that Adam and Eve only lived in three dimensions. They probably did, but you can't prove it. We only know everything about the creation and ourselves post-curse. But the key point here is they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. That's a very, very key point. That's the beginning of religion. That's the beginning of religion in the Bible. They tried to cover themselves. All religion tries to cover itself. The rebuttal to this is, uh, when the real reason I got into all this is I want to call your attention to a verse that most people don't pick up on, and that's verse 21 of this chapter. Let's take verse 20 and 21. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now the rabbis will point out that that verse, especially in the Hebrew, has far more significance than simply that it was her offspring populated the earth. That's certainly the way most of us read it. Mother of all living, sure, because her sons and their sons, you know, that, that started the population of the planet Earth for the last uh, 6,000 years, whatever, right? The rabbis point out that she's the mother of all living in another sense, also, because out of her came the Messiah. And so when you see, that, when you see any phrase like that, uh, put Christ right in the middle of it, and it'll give it a whole other complexion, if you will. But then verse 31 says, for Adam, uh, And for Adam also, and for his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? This is one of these little one-liners that's dropped in there, that if you're just reading the narrative, doesn't seem to have much import. But if you read from here through Revelation 22 and come back, by the time you've embraced the rest of the Bible, that verse has profound significance. What's, it, what's God really doing here? Giving them leather coats because they're more durable than the fig leaves they had sewn together? No. I don't think God would busy himself in that regard. What's hinted here at, it's taken for granted in a sense, uh, that the reader, if he's read, the, understands the Bible. God is teaching them that by the shedding of innocent blood they would be covered, not by their own effort. So it's a Levitical statement. And that becomes very significant when you get to chapter 4 in the Cain and Abel story. We all know about Cain and Abel. Cain took, was a farmer, took the fruit of the ground. Abel was a shepherd, took one of the sheep. One person's offering was accepted, the other one was not. 
There's speculation as to why Cain's offering was not accepted. Sin lieth at the door. Some say it was just envy. It, indeed, it may have been because Abel's offering was accepted. What everybody misses is the high likelihood. This is conjectural, but it's based on, I think, some good perceptions of the total, total body of God's Word, is that the idea of a sacrificial offering was instituted in Eden, and it was a lamb. The fact that Abel was a shepherd is not the point. He was giving an offering of faith, an offering that pointed to the ultimate lamb that was prophetically foreshadowed by Genesis 22 when Abram offered his son Isaac, etc. All through the scripture, the pointers, the focus, the, the anticipation is of a cross on Calvary. As I love to characterize it, a love letter written in blood on a wooden cross some 2,000 years ago. Now, once you understand that, when you get that glimmer, suddenly verse 21 of Genesis 3 has a different implication. The whole story of Cain and Abel has another coloration you begin to understand. That. Having said all that now, the, the, the clear indication, and I don't want to spend all our evening building the background, but many of the ideas that get formalized in the Mosaic Law were planted originally in Eden. The topic tonight is one that uh, normally we have just a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. But every once in a while there's a topic that um, you can't sort of elude. It's really uh, 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 very, uh, probably very controversial. Um, have you ever wondered about this whole issue of uh, Sabbath and Sunday? You read all through the Bible, the Sabbath this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and so on. And uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, we don't do that, do we? We, we worship on Sunday. And we, I've heard all the usual excuses, you know, for, for 40, 50 years, you know, been exposed to a lot of the arguments both ways. And um, uh, it's interesting that very, there are some you know, good people on both sides of that debate. Um, how many of you here have been troubled by that one way or the other? Okay, so it's not, okay, good. That's why I finally said, nuts, we're going to just jump into this and see what we can do. Now, uh, I should warn you in advance, um, we'll try to have something to offend everyone. We won't play any favorites. Um, some of the lawyers tell me that the, the definition of a satisfactory settlement is when both sides feel they've been equally cheated. See, and so we're going to talk. We're going to talk a little bit about the Sabbath day. Some of the questions we'll try to, to deal with is: Did God institute the Sabbath just for Israel? That's the common understanding by most Christians. Well, the Sabbath's an Old Testament thing. That's Moses' law. Well, okay. The other question is: Is, the, is what lurks behind all this is a Christian supposed to keep the Ten Commandments? Or just nine of them. I'm always reminded of that little cartoon that was the New Yorker. It was a church. It had a sign out in front. The, you know, the Light Church, L-I-T-E Church. Uh, we're the home of the 7.5% tithe. Uh, we have only seven commandments, your choice. A 15-minute sermon. Uh, you know, it had the, just a facetious, uh, you know, everything you wanted in a church and less, you know. And so, uh, but anyway... Um, one of the issues, does the Christian have to keep the Sabbath? That's one of the questions that lurks in the back of our mind. Give you a lot of good, glib theological answers why not, and yet it, link, it lurks there. And uh, if so, when did Sunday replace Saturday as the holy day? When did that happen? Where's the, you know, where's the authority for that? Where's the text for that? And we may have some surprises by looking at the Sabbath day prophetically, which is the thing that caused me the most disturbance as I got into it. Well, let's back up before we jump into this topic and talk a little bit about our roots. You might turn with me to um, Genesis chapter 3. Virtually every, uh, almost every major doctrine in the Bible has its roots planted in Genesis chapter 3. This first observation that we'll share or look into a little bit isn't directly related to the Sabbath day, but there's a reason I want to get into it. If you look at the first um, six verses, they're well familiar to you. That's where the serpent, the Nachash, the nachash uh, was more subtle or a clever or whatever than any beast of the field so forth and uh, said to the woman yea hath God said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden verse 2 and the woman said unto the serpent ye, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit which is in the midst of the garden God hath said you shall not eat it neither shall ye touch it lest ye die now he hadn't said lest ye touch it but she sort of added that which is the first indication of some kind of a problem verse 4 the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die now, there's Satan's steps. He hasn't changed in all these years. His first step is to cast doubt about God's word. Yea, hath God said? And the second step is to deny it. 
or refuted in some way. You know, you shall not surely die, contradicting God. For God doth surely know that the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree did desire to, be one, to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and also gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. We're all very, very famous episode, deserving of a great deal of study. But then both of their eyes, verse 7, were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now we know 44 verses 23 and 24, there are some verses to the priests, some instructions to the priests, but what caught my eye is the linkage in the mind of the presenter and thus planted in the priest is the linkage between this clean and unclean idea and the Sabbath. In Ezekiel 44 verse 23 it says, And they shall teach thy people the difference between the holy and the profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in controversy they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments, and they shall keep my laws and statutes and all my assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. There's more to the passage, but the point is these things are a package that the priest... Now it's Levitical, it's speaking of Ezekiel. It's actually talking about the millennium looking back, but okay. Well, let's get at the Sabbath. That's really our subject for tonight. Having said all that, turn to Genesis chapter 2. And we'll just read, uh, oh, the first three verses. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Two different words, created and made. How many people were around at that time? How many? Two, huh? We, 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 you know, we, have, we have sons and daughters and things coming, I think, right? A couple, maybe. Anyway, it's Adam and Eve, and if, if they had any children by then. I don't think they did, by the way. I think they had their children after the fall. Question, were they Jewish? Well, not, not, not. they were only in the sense that if you take the woman of Revelation 12, it starts with Eve as the, as the path from which the Messiah comes, who of course is Jewish. But I mentioned, I'm, I'm sort of being a, a tongue-in-cheek here a little bit. There's something else that I would like to uh, get at. Um, yeah, maybe, we should, let's, uh, maybe this is where we should have started. Let's start with Genesis 1, verse 1. Let's just take a quick, a quick glimpse at Genesis chapter 1, because I want to get it to another point. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. Seven words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved, brooded, upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, and that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. That's interesting. See, you and I think of darkness as the absence of light. That ain't this kind of darkness, because God separated light from darkness, two different things. We know that today, that's where we can talk about things like black holes and stuff, but let's move on. Verse 5, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day, or more precisely... The evening and the morning were day one. It's expressed in a very peculiar, unique way. The others are not that way. The evening and the morning, that's what I want to focus on a little bit. The word in the Hebrew today for evening is Erev. The word for morning is Bokar. Bokar Tov, good morning. Erev Tov, good night. Lila Tov, good evening. But anyway, because of that, it's translated appropriately, the evening and the morning were the first day. But if you start digging into the early roots of this passage, there are scholars that believe the root meaning of Erev was chaos or darkness. And it became the common term for evening because that's when the sun sets, things start to become indistinct and dark. In contrast to Boker, which the, in the morning, as twilight comes, you can begin to see structure and things and colors. If you visualize the, the sunrise, 
It's dark, you can't see what's going on, but as the light comes, you can begin to discern forms and shapes and so forth. And so they, they see the word bokar, they ha- its original concept was order. We have the evening and the morning being the first day. One of the things that we know today, using the terminology of the entropy laws, the second law of thermodynamics is, is uh, uh, that you, you always have a loss, right? I don't want to get into a whole thermodynamic session here, but there is, a, there is a entropy laws which in the thermodynamic sense are called the second law of thermodynamics, which essentially says any time you have a, a, a transfer of energy, there's a loss. There's no such thing as 100% efficiency. There's always a loss to the ambient. The ambient is called entropy thermodynamically. In an information sense, it's randomness. Order or design is the opposite of randomness or chaos or disorder. Now, one of the things that we experience today is that the entire universe is heading towards disorder. Putting it thermodynamics term, the entire universe is moving towards a uniform temperature. You can only do work if there's a temperature difference. And as you do work and there's a temperature difference, but you're always losing some, you're contributing to the overall ambience or entropy. And uh, the theory is that someday, since ne- they never see reversals of this, it's always downhill. It's as if the whole universe has been wound up and is winding down. Billions and billions of years, whenever, it'll suffer what the, the cosmologists would call a heat death, when there's uniform temperature, no more work can be done. You observe the entropy laws in every field of science except one. Every, there's, every field of science in its own area of interest observes, recognizes, acknowledges the so-called entropy laws, except one field. That's biology, the whole concept of life. You can't create order. Order is added externally, but they ignore that. But I won't start on that one. The creation would start using entropy terms with maximum entropy. And when you start creating order, you're reducing entropy. You, entropy. Think of entropy as randomness. As you start designing, you start doing something, you are adding information. And as God creates, one view of Genesis 1 is there were six specific stages of entropy reduction or design or creation. And the evening and the morning the root meaning may be the reduction of entropy, okay? Because it, it, the evening and morning were the first day. Creation was going on. And you, as you will, let's read on. Uh, verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and gathering together the waters he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. Every day he saw that it was good, except Monday. Interesting. And God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation and herb bearing seed, let the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth vegetation, herb yielding, uh, seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after its kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, and divide the night for, uh, the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, or for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven, to give light upon the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the nights, and made the stars also. And God let, set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. That's my premise. Don't accept it. Check it out with your own study. But I want you to at least be exposed to that possibility because I think it's very fundamental. A lot of things the Bible started, a lot of the the myths started to clarify once you begin to realize that Genesis is a summary, not a detailed chronology. I want to ask you, how many of each animal did Moses put in the ark? Anyone have a ten? How many said two? How many said two? It wasn't Moses, it was Noah. Come on. I played a dirty trick. It's a little, a little early in the evening. But you picked up the spirit of the thing, right? Most of, several of you got the right point. We all, because it's so classically summarized in children's books, two by two. But if you, I want you to take a good look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, in case you're not following us. In Genesis chapter 7, in verse 2, God says, Of every clean beast... 
Thou shalt take to thee by sevens, male and female, and of the beasts that are not clean, by two, male and his female. So as you visualize this procession going to the ark, you see two of each of the unclean, and seven each of the clean. Here's the question you can spring on your biblically oriented friends. How did Noah know what was clean and unclean? There's nothing intrinsically unclean about an unclean animal. The terms are Levitical. They are ceremonial. They are ritualistic. Pork is not clean. Pork is unclean. Why? Because the pigs roll in mud? No, it's got nothing to do with it. Clean and unclean, we, you and I, because we've read the Bible, we've been exposed to more of the Old Testament, take for granted that, yeah, there's these two categories, clean and unclean. Clean animals were used for sacrifice. Unclean were not. They didn't, they didn't, not only did they not eat them, they didn't do other, other things. They, they, were, they were two categories, but they're Levitical categories. Levitical categories. Now, what's the point I'm making? Noah, God could say that to Noah and he'd understand what he's talking about. What does that tell you? That there were institutions established long before Genesis 7. These ideas were prevalent. We know from Genesis 4, Cain and Abel gave offerings. Where are the rules? Where the, where is the requirement? Where is the procedure? Not recorded because we don't have that level of detail back then. The idea of clean and unclean animals apparently were established back in Eden. They were later codified under Mosaic law. Do you follow what I'm saying? And by the way, Noah was declared righteous. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Was he circumcised? No. Not to our knowledge. That was established in uh, Genesis 17. Key point. Abraham, who is generally regarded as the first Jew, the way I like to uh, upset my Jewish friends, God called an idol worshiping, uh, ca called Abraham out of an idol worshiping culture in Ur of the Chaldees and made him the first Jew. And they didn't like it put that way, but um, he was declared righteous. In Genesis 15, verse 6. He wasn't circumcised till Genesis 17. What circumcision got to do with the righteousness? Zero. Not really zero, because he was observant, he followed God's instruction, pretty much, not perfectly. And yet he was righteous. So there's those, there are those issues that start to emerge. Now, it's interesting, the premise that I'm assuming, and I, can, I think I can do it with some basis, I'm going to try to show that, is I suspect that the idea of the Sabbath was established in Eden. That's where I'm headed. Before we get even get into that, I want you a little more perspective on those early chapters before we jump to it. And by the way, this idea of clean and unclean, in Ezekiel 44, I just happened to see this and I thought it was interesting. In Ezekiel 